Uh, my name is Todd Costantini. I'm a trauma surgeon from San Diego, and it's my pleasure today to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Scott Sagraves. Uh, he is a trauma surgeon in the uh, Baylor Scott and White system in Central Texas and currently serves as their director of trauma services. He is the past president of the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma. And while already popular, will become extremely popular now as the soon to be new chair of the verification review and consultation program of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, that is the uh, entity that verifies in uh, all trauma centers and, and performs our site verifications and gives us our, our status. So um, Dr. Sabres is gonna give us a talk today on the role of the BRC and TQIP as agents of change. Thank you. I just uh, first wanted to thank Lacey so much for this coveted after lunch spot to let begin the afternoon. So I, I yeah, sure. And we're going to talk about regulation and verification. So thank you so much. I know you spent a lot of time on the program. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about, in my mind, what you all are doing here today and, and, and what's for the past two days and what's really the end goal or how are these gonna be put into practice uh, and give you a viewpoint from verification side of how we're using this hard work to help the trauma centers taking care of the patients that we're all concerned about. So, Regionally, Lacey said, you know, get this, we'll have an audience participation question and, you know, do all this stuff. Well, that kind of fell through, but the poll kept, you know, the, the question stayed in the uh, talk. And a lot of people have misconceptions of what the American College of Surgeons Community on Trauma Verification Review and Consultation Program is about. And so, you know, one thought is, well, are we the CPG storage site for the nation? No, that's incorrect. You know, do we designate individual trauma centers? No, that's the state's job. We verify individual trauma centers. And then are we a quality program of the ACS? Yes, we are part of that quality pillar of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. And then finally, are we responsible for the implementation of the CPG locally? No. That's local. You can take those from anywhere you want, and we may review what you're using, but we're not saying, you know, you have to implement this. We're suggesting, you know, best practices or the, the goal of um, the standards to give you the optimal resources. So a little bit about the College of Surgeons, and then we'll get into a little bit about verification. So the College of Surgeons, you can read this, um, Jack is 100 years old and the original college building is still um, standing over in uh, the near west side of uh, Chicago. And uh, it really started as a educational and to help develop the science around surgery, educate surgeons, but ultimately to set standards for surgical practice and improve the quality of care for all surgical patients. So this goes back to 1920. And, and many of you may or may not know, I, I know there's several surgeons in the room, several BRC reviewers in the room. And uh, so you may have heard this history before, but really the college is the precursor to the Joint Commission. In 1920, they put out this report to help hospitals standardize and to which every patient, as you can read, however humble, may receive the highest sense of uh, service known to, you know, the profession. You can read up, down things, you know, this was written in 1920s language. It's a little flowery and those type of things. But ultimately, this report came out to prevent avoidable mistakes from happening a second time. And isn't that what we're trying to put together as national guidelines? 
know, putting out something that the clinicians can use and then, you know, prevent that something from happening again. So this was, you know, one of the part of that report, and you can see they, they surveyed almost 700 hospitals, and those were the hospitals over 100 beds at the time. And you can see the East Coast is heavily populated with those hospitals, a couple in San Francisco, Los Angeles area, Chicago, obviously. But you can see it gets pretty well spread out. And certainly in the rural areas that we've been talking about, even in 1920, they didn't really have the same access you know, that, you know, some of the more populated areas do as well. So what's about the quality programs that is really important to the mission of the College of Surgeons? Well, it was developed uh, according to this four part framework. And these are the guiding principles, if you will, for all quality programs. And it's not just the VRC, there's T clip, there's the NIST clip, there's you know, children's, there's several different programs that go on. Uh, and they all started with program specific standards. And then it developed uh, the infrastructure needed to develop the high quality and high value care. The key thing is that high quality data. And we're, you know, working around this now of where do we get the data? What do, how can we implement the data to develop our clinical practice guidelines? And so this is all part of the infrastructure for the quality programs to have high quality data. And for you all involved in trauma and trauma center, you know, verification, you know, the trauma, trauma quality improvement project or TQIP is out there. And that's the college's quality uh, data source uh, for these programs. And then once you've met all these three things or these first three things are developed, then to have a process of verification uh, and accreditation. And somebody said, um, trust, but verify. And that's really what we're coming out to do in the, the quality programs, specifically the VRC. So what is the ultimate goal? Well, if many of you may know, this, this is a key quip graft of all the trauma centers that are supplying data um, to uh, TQIP. And the goal here is to get all the ones, the, the low performing people centers, which are in the red, um, down to the green. And at least, at least even it out. Because when you have high variability in the care, you have outliers develop versus the, the high performers, which we've seen in various reviews that the high performers have less variability. They're more consistent and they're more consistent in their approach to the care of the injured patient. Part of that is clinical practice guidelines. And so how a center adopts and uses evidence-based clinical practice guidelines really makes a difference on where they're coming out in some of their odds ratios, and this one is just a snapshot of overall hospital mortality. But what's the difference? What makes uh, a facility in the red or a poor performer versus somebody in the green, a high performer? And, you know, there's a, it's multifactorial, but one of the things is maintaining that consistency, developing a framework that will be consistent for the injured, uh, you know, care of the injured patient. So getting up to the VRC, um, and again, verification, review, and consultation. And it truly is uh, one of the flagship programs of, of the Committee on Trauma for that matter, but, you know, for all of the quality programs at the college, it's been around for quite some time, and I'll go into a little bit of history. Um, and it really helps develop the statutory requirement for trauma centers uh, and for their designation in many states. Many states that say, yeah, we ultimately designate somebody, but we won't designate without verification from the College of Surgeons. So it, it really comes into play um, to help states um, adopt the standards that are out there 
help the states uh, designate and, and grow their trauma network. In 2023, we visited over uh, 290 uh, centers. And it's kind of a, a mixed number because, you know, the new standards came out in September of 2023 uh, or were implemented. And so the, the first uh, three quarters of the year uh, essentially were from the, the previous standards uh, that were last published in, in 2020, uh, 2014. And we have, you know, approaching 600 verified trauma centers throughout the United States. So this is the standards book that I've mentioned, and you can see it dates back from uh, 1976. And um, I personally have been involved with trauma since the Blue Book, uh, you know, as a trainee, as a med student. But those were the that was the first exposure I got, actually here in Chicago, um, as a student to the verification process, the standards, and those type of things. And throughout my career, we, the Chad. Standards have grown, changed, been refined, been developed to the current uh, standards book, um, which is this great book. And we previously called the books by their color. And so uh, now this one is just adopted into the great book. Um, Dr. Nathan's, the head of quality programs for the college, would probably cringe at that. But even he has started to say, yeah, the great book. Well, so what we're seeing though is a change. And for those of you who get into this routinely, you can see the form and process of this new book, the new standards book is changed. Um, it is set up to mirror all the other quality programs. So for you trauma program managers, trauma medical directors in the audience, or you know ones back at your facilities, the, the process has changed. There's a new portal uh, to submit your stuff, uh, materials, new uploads, and um, they're asking, we're asking for a few more things like, what are your CPGs? How are you managing CPGs in your form, performance improvement plan? Let me give you a couple of uh, you know, examples. So this is actually a standard in the book, 5.1, and it, titled what it is, Clinical Practice Guidelines. And you can see it applies to all levels of trauma center. And this is the way the book's set up now. And so you have the standard, you have the definition requirement. Sometimes you have added information. How are you going to be measured for your compliance in the standard? And then resources if they're available. And so if that's the case, you can see on this standard, and the pro, you know, the reason why we're all here is clinical practice guidelines provide an opportunity to standardize practice that facilitates training and uh, improves the quality. And that's what the BRC is all about. So we also have in the quality um, area of the college a best practice guidelines section. These aren't clinical practice guidelines per se, but using the TQIP data, we've put together these best practices based on all that we've seen in the TQIP. And so um, not so much a guideline, it's just a statement of best practices that we've seen over, uh, you know, around the country through our TQIP data, excuse me, data analysis. Where else does, you know, clinical practice guidelines come into play? Well, in your, another standard in the PIPs player really talks about performance improvement and how you perform, how you improve your performance is by meeting compliance with your guidelines. And that's what's being reviewed. Because we can't come in and say, okay, when you take out a spleen, uh, how do you split a, a fracture? I'm not there for trauma call with you, but I can look at your PIPs plan and say, well, did you follow your activation CPG? Did you follow your discharge one? Did you follow your antibiotics within an hour? What's your compliance with those? And how are you, you know, improving your performance? We're very not, we're trying not to be prescriptive, although there are a couple standards that do say you have to have certain guidelines. 
you know, the care of the elderly patient has a list of several that you have, as well as like massive transfusion. So finishing up, basically, uh, you know, how does the VRC utilize these CPGs uh, to verify a trauma center? Um, it, it's really the CPG compliance and the process improvement review. And that's how, why this is so important. Not that the VRC is dictating what CPGs you have to have, but utilizing the hard work that this group is developing to include them in the standards and hold the trauma centers accountable um, to compliance with their own guidelines. So with that, I know it's a quick breeze through, um, open for questions. Thank you very much. Scott, that was a great summary. Um, can you tell us how TQIP benchmarking, and you talked about what the idea behind it is, but how TQIP benchmarking has actually moved the bar? Do you have data to show that changes or suggestions uh, that you know were made earlier on based on TQIP findings at those institutions have things changed over time? Absolutely, Warren, thank you. Um, and Warren's the vice chair of the committee on trauma. So we're in high, uh, you know, uh, community here with him being here. Uh, I think uh, Jeff is also here. So, um, but to your point, to your question, you know, benchmarking, you know, before you think, oh, we're doing a great job. And now TQIP comes along and you submit data. And now I can look at my center and compare it to warrant and say, okay, well, he did better on this, but I did better on that. And so with TQIP having 600 centers, now you're comparing apples to apples. And so you really have an idea of where you stand nationally within TQIP. And so then it's just not about a number. You and your performance improvement plan take the TQIP data that you get, and you get two reports a year, and we're in the process of you know figuring where those, uh, how those reports are going to be generated and stuff like that. But you get those reports back, and then in, in your performance improvement program, you go, yeah, I'm above. I'm a, a low uh, former. And so then it allows you to deep dive into areas that you're not performing up to the national standard, if you will, or performing as well as some of the other centers that are, are contributing data. And that's where I find it makes the most benefit or produces the most action because it's benchmark against the nation and we're a competitive bunch so if you see your centers in the red, okay, what can we do to improve it? Because by inference, you're in the red, you may not be performing as well for your patients. And so digging in introspection within your institution and then, you know, resubmitting data and seeing how you've improved or changed. That's really the, the core of benchmarking for the uh, TQIP. Yeah, I guess uh, across the spectrum. So TQIP's been out now for quite a while, 10 years roughly. Yeah. And please. so since from 10 years ago to now, have we seen that uh, the variability has decreased? Have we seen that um, more centers are closer to that benchmark line that you're kind of Absolutely. looking for? Absolutely. And I don't have all the distinct numbers and there's so much, there's many different categories, uh, but overall we've seen everybody getting closer to that, to that, um, you know, that one line or that benchmark line, that, that, that average line. And so we're seeing less low outliers, more high performers, um, but it's really the work at the centers. I mean, we give the report, we analyze the data and then push it back to them. And then they introspect in, in themselves. So we have seen some normalization, some improvement, um, and 
part of that is as a reviewer going out and seeing, okay, you identified a problem. How did you correct it? Well, we adopted a guideline or we created a guideline or we did something along those lines or we had a, a you know root cause analysis and we figured out what we need to do locally to improve that. And by and far, we go back and when we re-review them, you have reports over the last two, three years and you can see the trends of improvement. Okay, what did you do? What did you change? How did you you know, become more compliant with this. So, yes, to answer your question, Shirley, we've seen uh, vast improvement. And that's one of the values, I think, in subscribing to TQIP is your benchmark against other centers. So, so we're not benchmarking a three of, against a one. That's, you know, that wouldn't be fair, the resources and everything else. But you are benchmarked as a three to other threes. So what are they doing? Uh, what are you missing? Or if you're a high performer, what can you share with us uh, about a best practice? And so that's where TQIP is really one of the strongest benchmarking systems uh, in the country. Thank you so much. Thank you.